1620, while the Mayflower was in Provincetown, 18 of its men sailed in a small shallop, searching for a place to live. They came to present-day East Ham, where they were met by a group of Nosset. After a brief but violent encounter, the English left towards today's Plymouth. In 2020, we remember this first encounter. We explore its meanings for today and tomorrow. Welcome everyone to the East Ham 400 Sunset Series. My name is John Hanlon. Today we'd like to welcome Humberto Ortega, who lives in Boston. Humberto grew up in Provincetown, arriving here at the age of 10. He graduated from Provincetown High School in 2009 before it closed. In 2012, he was able to become a DACA recipient, also known as a Dreamer. DACA is a program uh, the acronym stands for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It enabled young immigrants who came to the United States as children under the age of 16, but below the age of 30, and before June 15, 2007, to receive protection from deportation in two-year renewable installments for a large fee, depending on background checks and enrollment or completion of their education. In September 2017, President Trump canceled the program and stopped all new applications. This past June 18th, the United States Supreme Court decided that the Trump administration's attempts to end the program were done incorrectly, allowing the program to continue for now. Welcome, Humberto. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. What was it like growing up in Provincetown, undocumented? Um, so it was a little different than most people, obviously. Um, when you're young, you don't really see the difference. It's only when you start getting older. Um, I came at an age of 11 years old, so it was all playing with friends. But as soon as you start getting older and when you hit 16 years old and your friends are getting their driver license, um, IDs, uh, things have changed a little bit. So it was it was different, like not being able to apply for any of that stuff. Um, it did. I don't look at it as a bad thing. I think um, it humbled me a lot. And when I got the opportunity, I was really grateful and thankful for it. Um, so it's it was it was different. A lot of people don't even realize, like even going to college is is harder because. There's no financial aid. Exactly. So at the age of 16, a lot of my friends um, were looking into colleges, maybe a little bit older, 17. And my mindset or the way my parents described it to me, it was basically start working now because um, you don't have the, the same opportunities as your friends. So I started working at a young age uh, full time, especially in Provincetown because it's seasonal. So I worked all summer long for years. And in my mind, I didn't look at college even an option. So I just started working really hard um, with my parents at the store. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So how did your life change when President Obama started the DACA program and you were able to qualify? My life changed, it almost felt like um, like a big turn in my life. Um, as soon as I got my the opportunity to apply, I had the option to get a driver license and get some kind of um, ID. So as, as soon as I got it, I think within a year, I got my driver license and I moved to Boston um, that same year to look for more opportunities. Um, I went to Boston and started working different jobs. Uh, my first job was at Starbucks, which uh, I was waking up at 4 a.m. doing like early shifts. Taking the train from East Boston to the airport, right? Correct, yeah. yeah. And then, um, then I started doing the Boys and Girls Club, and that was probably like, the best job I've ever had, working with kids. And it was great working with kids over there because it was a it's in East Boston and there's a big Latin community, so I saw a lot of those kids a reflection in me because they were little and they were just coming from a different country. So 
I've always been involved in sports, so I was able to connect sports and education and help them out. And even when I got done working there, I started volunteering. That's just how much I, I loved working with the kids. But yeah, DACA gave me the opportunity to, um, to get a job that you love so much and get paid for. And that's something I didn't have before um, DACA. So I, I know um, that you're a person of strong faith. How does it make you feel when there are other people in, in you know, faith, faithful people who don't recognize your, your people like you your, in your situation as an issue of faith? Um, I've always been strong with my faith. I think that's why it's been always pushing me. Um, and like I said earlier, that having like not what I, um, not, not being able to do certain things, it made me humble. And I think it's just um, God gave me that ability, you know. Not to judge others. Exactly, not to judge others. Um, being thankful for the small things, like even having um, a driver license, more than anything, I think it's the freedom. And um, till this day, because DACA is not a permanent thing, so I do feel a little bit secure now, but still not living with that freedom. But also that freedom, um, not be able to feel that freedom helped me a lot, um, taking more um, shots in life, I guess. So when we think of the East Ham 400 and the story of the pilgrims and all, do you identify yourself more with the pilgrims who are coming to a, a land for a new opportunity, or do you identify with the people that the pilgrims excluded, like the Native Americans? So I think definitely the freedom part. I think they came here to, to look for freedom, and that's something. It's funny because I was thinking about this a few days ago, just looking over some of the stuff that I've done in the past years, but I felt like I had the freedom to achieve my goals. Um, and that's why I think my parents brought us to this country because in our country, the opportunities are not the same. Um, it's, it's just a lot, it's, you can make it, I guess, in Mexico, but it's just so much harder living in the United States. It's, it's a dream to a lot of people and it's definitely a dream come true to me. That's great. So I have to ask you this, growing up in Provincetown, where uh, you know you went to school with a lot of kids who maybe whose parents, or not parents, but ancestors were pilgrims. Or I know we, we used to uh, recreate the whole pilgrim dinner with the and have kids dress up as native people and pilgrims. Um, wh what did you take from that experience as someone who was different from your classmates? So we never had like the whole Thanksgiving in Mexico. Um, growing up with it, it was it was great because a lot of my friends, like you said, they have a Portuguese, I guess, background, and um, having turkey is probably like, the best thing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it was great. It's just a, a day where you got um, together with friends, had a dinner, and it was great. It's it was a good experience for me. So it was an opportunity to really become like an American. Exactly. Yeah. If if I felt. Um, the, uh, how do you say, patriotic? Pa patriotic? Patriotic, yeah, yeah, of it. Oh, that's great. So anything else that you want to add about your experiences here and how it might relate to this East Ham 400 anniversary? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that um, on, on the way, you know, like even though I didn't have a lot of stuff, but I, I met a lot of great people like you who was always there for me and um, and helped me, so... Um, I thank you for that, and it's just about um, getting the right people in your life. Great. Well, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Right. Appreciate it. My name is Joanna Hollick. Thank you for watching today's episode of the Sunset Series. If you're interested in participating more actively in learning about local history, there are several sites and landmarks here in East Ham that you can visit. One such landmark is Indian Rock. Indian Rock is a 20-ton glacial boulder that was used by Native Americans for tool sharpening. 
The stone was likely used for sharpening bone items, such as harpoon heads, fish hooks, and stone axes. Today, you can still see these markings that the tools made in the stone. Also known as sharpening rock, this boulder was moved to the top of Skiff Hill near Hemingway Landing in 1965 due to shoreline retreat. You can still find the rock there today. From the parking lot at the end of Hemingway Road, it is a one-tenth of a mile walk uphill to the rock. And we encourage you to visit this historic landmark. Thank you.